chapter 10, the revolt of the provinces. Although many provincial federes had taken part in the storming of the Tuileries, the fall of the French monarchy had very largely been the work of the insurrectionary commune of Paris. The very idea of a national convention to give France a republican constitution also originated in the Paris sections. It was therefore understandable that the sans-culottes should regard themselves as the guardians and watchdogs of the new republic and the arbiters of what it should stand for. And of course, they were very well placed to enforce their will. The convention sat in Paris. It had no forces to defend itself from popular pressure. All available troops in 1792 and 1793 were occupied at the front. And the Paris National Guard was no longer the force that had shot down Republican petitioners on the Champ de Mars. Since the end of July, it had been open to all citizens and was little more than a sans-culotte militia, commanded from 10th August by Santerre, a rich brewer but long a popular activist in the city's east end. The legislative assembly <clears throat> had been forced to recognize its own helplessness in the face of Parisian power during its last weeks. Its only attempt to assert itself, the decree dissolving the commune and ordering new elections on 30th August, was ostentatiously ignored and rapidly rescinded. And the deputies had had to sit powerless while the same sans culotte who claimed to be the nation's conscience massacred half the capital's prison population during the following week. The nation's representatives were clearly in the clutches of a capricious and bloodthirsty mob. And in this respect, the convention was no more secure than its predecessor. Never forget, the ex-monk Shabbat warned his fellow deputies, that you were sent here by the sans culotte. None of them was likely to, but they were deeply divided over whether that committed them to continue to do Paris bidding. The role of the capital in national affairs was to be the most hotly debated issue during the first nine months of the convention's existence. Leading the attack on Paris were those who had sought to avert the insurrection of 10th August and whom Robespierre had tried to have arrested by 
the commune just as the prison massacres were beginning. Men like Brissat, Vergniaud, and the faction of the Gironde. They had been deputies in the previous assembly, but they were supported by a number of newcomers too. They were not a party and never would be, except in the wishful imagination of their opponents. But they all sat for provincial constituencies. And the more prominent among them had grown used to informal cooperation with each other throughout the legislative. They tended to meet as they had been at the House of Roland, still Minister of the Interior. <clears throat> there his pretty and ambitious wife, though a Parisian herself, railed constantly against Marat, Danton, Robespierre, and the whole Parisian delegation in the convention. These men, the Girondins, were convinced, had been deeply implicated in the September massacres and intended to use their Parisian support to seize national power. Within days of the convention's first meeting, the challenge was thrown down. The ex-constituent Buzat, soon to become Madame, Madame Roland's lover, <clears throat> proposed the establishment of a departmental guard recruited outside Paris to protect the convention. Do you suppose, he asked, we are to be enslaved by certain deputies of Paris? The Montagnard response was to denounce the idea of federalism. An attempt to dissipate the unity of the nation. They proposed and carried a declaration that the Republic was one and indivisible. Most deputies were happy to vote for both proposals, reluctant as they were to become involved in the faction fights of extremists whose antagonisms seemed as much personal as principled. But the uncommitted deputies of the plain, as they soon became known, from their tendency to sit in the middle of the house. Between Montagnards on the left of the chair and Girondins on the right, were quickly to find that the antagonism between the two factions colored every issue. For much of October, the object of Girondin attack was Marat, and the shame Paris had brought upon itself by electing one who had constantly advocated massacres. He had also regularly called for a dictator 
and to the Girondines it seemed obvious whom he had in mind. Robespierre. On 29 October, Louvet openly accused this insolent demagogue of aspiring to dictatorship. On 4th December, the attack was turned on Philippe Egalité when Buzat moved that anyone advocating a restoration of monarchy should suffer the death penalty. The inference was that the Montagnards planned to make this former prince of notorious ambition king once Louis the fifteenth was sixteenth was dead. <clears throat> Everything to do with the king's fate, in fact, drove the factions even wider apart. The Montagnards suspected their opponents of seeking reconciliation with him before 10th August. They were right, but they had no proof. When Roland announced the discovery of the Armoire de Fer, they accused him of removing documents from it that implicated his friends. Just as those it did contain revealed the earlier treachery of Mirabeau. <clears throat> on 3rd January, <clears throat> amid the voting on the king's trial, They, at, they again insisted on debating rumors of secret correspondence between the Bordeaux deputies <coughs> and the Tuileries the previous July. The aim now was to discredit the Girondin-sponsored idea of an appeal to the people over the death sentence. This in its turn was designed to thwart the obvious determination of Paris and its sections that the king should be executed without delay. Montagnards argued that the appeal would be a call to civil war Girondines responded that not only not to allow the departments to pronounce on the king's fate would in itself provoke such a war. The Girondin idea of clemency was debated in similar terms. And the way a deputy had voted in these two contentious divisions was to mark him politically forever both in the subsequent public affairs of revolutionary France and in the analysis of its historians. All these clashes had taken place at a time of victory in the war, but even foreign policy was not unmarked by them. Du Maurier had always been associated with those now called Girondines, and they reveled in his successes. It was they who proposed offering fraternity and assistance to foreign sympathizers, but Robespierre, who warned of the futility of trying to establish liberty in foreign countries by force. Yet, when Brissot quite uncharacteristically became <clears throat> the advocate of caution and argued for reprieving the king so as not to antagonize more foreign powers, 
The Montagnards scorned his cowardice and were in the van of the movement to declare war on Great Britain, Holland, and Spain. Then, having dispatched the king and challenged most of Europe to a fight to the death, the factions returned to their vendetta. The Montagnards now had a martyr to their cause. On 20th January, the former nobleman and judge in the Paris Parliament, Le Pelletier de Saint Fargo, was assassinated by a fellow noble who blamed him for voting for the king's execution. His remains were placed in the Pantheon, the mausoleum for national heroes established in the former church of St. Genevieve in 1791. Even as men began to talk of removing those of Mirabeau, the first to be placed there after Voltaire. The Jacobin Club also now became a Montagnard monopoly. Brissat had been expelled from this scene of his former triumphs as early as October. And on 1st of March, all deputies who had voted for the appeal to the people on the king's execution were likewise excluded. The Montagnards failed to capture the Ministry of the Interior when Roland, wearied by their repeated attacks, resigned on 22nd January. But they did defeat a renewed proposal for a departmental guard. And they tore to pieces a projected constitution brought forward by Condorcet on 15 February on the grounds that it was a charter for federalism and executive paralysis. In all this, they felt confident of popular support in Paris. But in fact, now, the great drama of the king's trial and execution was over. The people of the capital were turning their attention to more everyday matters. On 12th of February, the convention received a deputation from the sections of Paris calling for comprehensive price controls on basic commodities. The petitioners called their proposal, proposal a maximum. With rare unanimity, the deputies rejected the idea. They believed that attempts to interfere with the free exchange of goods did more to distort markets than supply them, and they had in fact renounced all economic controls as recently as December of 1792. Even Marat who believed the only solution to scarcity was to guillotine hoarders and speculators, denounced the petitioners as dangerously misguided. They were reacting, however, to a serious deterioration in the economic situation in the capital. Throughout 
the upheavals of 1792. The value of the Asinites had continued to decline. By January 1793, they were down to 51% of their face value. Despite the decision to make them legal tender in occupied territories. Coinage, on the other hand, was becoming increasingly rare. Requisitioning and bulk purchasing for the ummies over the autumn had disrupted the supply of many basic commodities. And war against the maritime powers had brought a blockade on seaborne imports. In particularly hard hit were the products of the West Indies, where deepening chaos was devastating the economy of the French islands and leaving all reliable productions in the hands of the British. Such disruptions were reflected in commodity prices. By February, sugar had doubled or trebled since 1790, and soap had more than doubled. Other items like coffee and candles were also rising steadily. These increases provided the impetus behind calls for a maximum, which were renewed in petitions to the convention in the Jacobin Club between 22nd and 24th February. When they remained Unanswered, the city was swept by a wave of attacks on grocery shops and warehouses throughout the 25th. Mostly the crowds, led as usual by women, behaved traditionally, fixing prices at levels they considered just selling the stocks they found at those and handing the proceeds to the hapless shopkeepers. But there was more outright pillage and pilfering than the previous year, and crude and brutal threats were more overt. The summer's bloodshed had clearly lowered the threshold of acceptable violence. On the 26th, Santerre's National Guards restored order, but the whole convention was visibly shaken by the outburst. The Girondins predictably blamed the incitements of Marat. The Montagnards suspected a plot organized by Rue, who since the autumn had been calling for hoarders and speculators to be treated the same way as Louis the Last. They began to call Rue and his associates such as Jean Varlet, who ranted daily to passers-by from a soapbox just outside the convention hall. The Rabbids, enragé. There had probably been no plot on 25th February, but the outbreak certainly seemed to have engendered the idea of one. It developed rapidly in the crucible of the new crisis which broke in March.
determined to build on the autumn's victories and replace the one-year volunteers who were now leaving the army. The convention decided that the newly expanded war would require more than volunteers. On 24th February, it decreed a new levy of 300,000 men to be raised by volunteering, if possible, but conscription if necessary, with each department allotted a quota. Local authorities would be free if they saw fit to find their recruits among eligible young males by the well-tried technique used for raising the pre-revolutionary militia, drawing lots. Such a return to hated practice only abolished four years previously was bound to be unpopular. And in fact, only half the 300,000 men were ever raised. But in some parts, it was more than unpopular. And in the department of the Vendée, the first attempts to conscript in the early days of March met with violent resistance which within weeks had flared up into an open rebellion against the entire course the revolution had taken. The Vendéan peasants resented their able-bodied young men being taken off to fight distant enemies with whom they had no quarrel by authorities with whom their quarrel was limitless. They resented the fact that the conscription decree was implemented by bourgeois from the local towns and who were themselves exempt because of the public offices they held. The National Guard, who were merely these bourgeois and their friends in uniform, were deemed mobilized on the spot, which meant that they did not have to go to the front either, yet were the main force needed to compel others to go. The disturbances began with clashes between peasant youths and national guards. And who were these uniformed, self-styled patriots forcing others to fight their battles? The same people who had ejected non juring priests in 1791 and forced in intrusive newcomers. The same people who had bought up the best church lands when they had come on the market. Townsmen who had done consistently well out of the revolution at the expense, so it seemed of surrounding present communities and the church upon which loyalties had focused in the calmer, remoter days when the king had reigned undisputed. These resentments had been simmering and spluttering throughout the western France for over a year in innumerable clashes with peasants and local authorities over recruiting drives and measures against non-juring priests. The zeal of both sides intensified after 10th August, 1791. 
In the declaration of a republic made the king a new rallying point for those opposed to the patriots. Down with the national cockade, shouted malcontents, who gathered in thousands in the Vendée late. In August 1792, long live the king, up with the nobles. Nobles, in fact, played little part in these outbreaks and only joined the Western rebels in 1793 after the insurgents had made it clear that they were anxious to have noble leaders, but in patriotic eyes, they were all aristocrats. Much of rural Brittany also rose in March 1793, and not only against conscription, pay no more taxes, urged one Breton agitator. Since there's no more king, there are no more laws. Be fucked to the nation. But Brittany was better garrisoned and the garrisons better armed than south of the Loire. Within a month, the Breton Risings had been suppressed and districts were meeting their quotas under the February Decree. Resistance continued with great determination, but in the form of guerrilla warfare. Chouanerie which was to plague the departments along the Channel Coast for the rest of the decade and beyond. In the Vendée, however, peasant hordes stormed the little towns where Patriot power was based, and the local authorities collapsed. Military reinforcements were unable to penetrate the labyrinth Bocage countryside. By 13th March, recognizable leaders had begun to emerge, including the ex soldier Stolfet, Stofflet whose 10,000 men could overwhelm regular troops sent against them by sheer weight of numbers. Soon, too, the rebels were wearing sacred hearts, crosses, and white cockade of royalism. Long live the king and our good priests, was their cry. We want our king, our priests, and the old regime. And they wanted, noted a terrified Republican who observed this, to kill off all the patriots. Reports of this unprecedented resistance to revolutionary authority began to reach Paris during the second week in March. They coincided with increasingly bad news from Belgium, where the Austrians had counter-attacked on the first and turned the flank of Dumouriez's advance into Holland. Yet Dumouriez had refused to draw back until explicitly ordered to do so. And some deputies began to sniff treachery. The Girondins had been keen to adopt Dumouriez when he was driving the enemy before him. And the taint he now began to acquire rubbed off on them. 
by 8 March, it was being alleged in the convention that the armies were in headlong retreat. In panic, swept the capital. Danton, who knew the situation in Belgium at first hand, called for volunteers from Paris to march north and save the campaign, which did nothing to restore calm. Everybody remembered how the previous September the departure of volunteers had occasioned the prison massacres. Certain elements in Paris evidently believed that this was the moment to eliminate the city's enemies in the convention. Some sections began to demand the establishment of a revolutionary tribunal to try traitors. And the Jacobin Club took up the call. The convention accepted the proposal on the ninth and decreed in the same session that deputies should be sent out to all departments as representatives on mission to explain and expedite war emergency measures. That night, armed bands toured the print shops where the leading Girondin journals were produced smashing the presses and destroying copy. They were in disguise, but seemed to have been organized by a radical club calling itself the Defenders of the One and Indivisible Republic, whose leading light was himself a journalist, Jacques René Hébert, producer of the increasingly popular Père Dochnezne. The next day, these same elements tried to organize a full-scale insurrection which would force the convention to arrest all suspect generals, ministers, in the leading Girondin deputies. Enragés like Varlet joined in. The tocsin was rung and the city gates closed. But the commune refused to become involved and Santerre put together 9,000 national guards to maintain order. The insurgents melted away, yet a precedent had been set, and all sides recognized it. Popular action might be used to purge the convention of unpopular elements. The Montagnards as yet shrank from such an assault on the nation's elected representatives. Although the Girondins were quite prepared to believe and say that the hated deputies of Paris had been implicated once again in a plot to massacre them. Understandably, but fatally, their worries about the threat from Paris were developing into an all-consuming obsession. For weeks afterwards, they raked over the murky details of the abortive journey. 
while the bad news both from the Vendée and Belgium got worse. On 12 March, Dumouriez openly denounced French policy in Belgium, sowing new suspicions. His defeat at Neerwinden a week later intensified them. Treason was not its cause, but it was its result. And only the refusal of his army to cooperate prevented him from marching on Paris to restore the Constitution of 1791 with the infant Louis XVII as king. His perfidy was generally recognized a fortnight before his flight across the Austrian lines on 6th of April. Nobody came well out of the crisis. Girondines fell under suspicion from their previous association with the traitor. But leading Montagnards like Danton suffered from their last-minute attempts to strike deals which might prevent his defection. Yet it was the Montagnards who produced all the constructive proposals for dealing with the crisis, and most of the votes in the convention went their way, even though many of their sympathizers were now heading off to the departments as representatives on mission. The new measures included the establishment of watch committees, Comité de Surveillance, throughout the country to scrutinize the activities of foreigners and suspects, 21st March, and an attempt to bring the war effort under more decisive legislative control through a new coordinating committee. Ever since the fall of the monarchy, executive power had nominally been vested in a council of ministers, but each minister was shadowed by a specialist committee of the convention. On 1st January, a committee of general defense was set up to coordinate these bodies, but it proved cumbersome and ineffective, and the crisis of March led to a search for something stronger. On the 25th, accordingly, on the suggestion of a deputy now making a name for himself as a divisor of ingenious compromises, Bertrand Barrer, a 25-member committee of public safety was created to take over its role. By the time the committee it began to function on 7th April, its membership had been reduced to nine renewable monthly. <clears throat> Barrer was elected. and would prove its longest-serving member. But Robespierre declined election because he doubted the committee's value. The dominant voice for its first two months would be that of Danton. And for much of that time, he preached union and reconciliation in the face of the dangers confronting the nation. His urgings, however, fell on deaf ears. Montagnards had hoped in setting up the revolutionary tribunal to use it against those whom they saw as impeding the war effort by their vendetta against Paris. Girondins, however, saw that this sword was double-edged and it was from them that a proposal came on 1st of April to abolish 
deputies immunity from arrest. Success in this cleared the way for an attack on the most exposed figure in the Montagnard ranks, recognized even by his own side in their cooler moments as a liability Marat. As president of the Jacobins on 5th April, he had signed a circular appealing to the provinces to defend Paris against a sacrilegious cabal in the convention attempting thus to steal what the Girondins regarded as their own constituency, alleging an insult to the convention they called on 12th April for Marat to be impeached and with normal Montagnard support depleted by the absence of many of their normal allies on mission, the motion passed overwhelmingly. 33 sections of Paris responded to this attack by, on their hero by calling for the expulsion from the convention of 22 named deputies, including Brissat, all the Bordelais, and Pétillon, who had drifted away from his earlier radicalism since the fall of the monarchy. Both the Jacobins and the Commune endorsed the demand, but withdrew their appeal when Robespierre, reluctant to see the nation's representatives coerced, condemned it. In any case, they had their revenge on 24th of April when Marat was acquitted by the Revolutionary Tribunal and carried shoulder high from the court back to the convention by exultant sans culotte. <clears throat> Among the charges brought against him had been that he had incited the populace to take the law into its own hands against hoarders and speculators in his paper, renamed Journal de la République Française, since the previous September. On the morning after the February grocery riots, his acquittal now encouraged the sections to renew their pressure on economic questions. Even before his trial, they had begun to call again for controls on the price of bread and grain, amid Girondin denunciations of their economic illiteracy. Ominously, the Montagnards who had joined in the defense of free markets in February were silent. By the end of the month, in fact, they had changed tack completely and were supporting demands for controls, cheered on by the convention's public galleries. On 30th April, Girondins began to declare that the assembly was no longer safe in Paris and called for its sittings to be transferred to Versailles predicting economic disaster if price controls were forced upon it. But that was what happened on 1st of May. The convention was mobbed by 8,000 demonstrators from the Faubourg Saint Antoine who declared themselves in a state of insurrection until price controls on bread were introduced. <clears throat> Nothing was conceded that day, but fear of a less controlled recurrence led to the passing on the next of a law formally promulgated on the 3rd, stipulating a maximum price for grain and bread 
and giving local authorities wide powers of search and requisition. Overt Montagnard advocacy of such a measure marked a turning point, a recognition that Parisian support could not be taken for granted, even against the Girondins. As a police spy reported in the interior minister, the Jacobins know only too well that the people cannot be resisted when one needs them. They may have been alarmed that even in Paris there were signs of resistance to conscription since it was this that had plunged the provinces into turmoil. And not only in the West, there were reports of riots against the 300,000 levy from places as far apart as Franche-Comté, Western Languedoc and Normandy. More alarming still, in the course of the spring, some of the major provincial cities began to break away from central authority. First to waver was Marseille. All the more shockingly in that the great Mediterranean port had been a watchword for radicalism ever since 1789. The sans culotte remembered with admiration the arrival of, a, of the militant Marseille Federé in July of 1792. But Marseille radicalism was in many ways the response of a vigorous minority of activists to a conservative hinterland and a mercantile community clearly reluctant to commit either its energies or its wealth to the patriotic struggle. This detachment had allowed the militants of the local Jacobin club to seize political control of the city and even in defiance of the legislative assembly to transfer the seat of departmental administration from A in August 1792. From this position, they sniped constantly at the rich and continued to do so even when the upheavals in the West Indies and deteriorating relations with the maritime powers began to threaten the whole basis of the city's commerce. Uneasy in the absence of so many of their most stalwart sympathizers as volunteers in the Ummies, and obsessed by rumors of royalist plots, which experience had shown, were often more than figments in the Midi. The Marseille Jacobins took the news of the establishment of a revolutionary tribunal in Paris as a license to establish one of their own. They also decreed a general disarmament and a forced loan on the rich to fund measures of revolutionary vigilance. And they carried this policy to the surrounding countryside in expeditions sent out to support the often embattled clubs of little towns inland. After the former nobility, declared representatives of the Marseille Jacobins, 
The bourgeoisie is the class which weighs heaviest on the people. But, in fact, it soon became clear that the people were prepared to rally behind their supposed oppressors in resisting the Jacobin militants. Resistance coalesced in the city's 32 sections, once themselves a bastion of Jacobinism. Their meetings had been gradually packed over the winter with port workers whose livelihoods were as threatened by economic disruption as those of the great merchants. The two groups now made common cause against the Jacobinism, which they saw as the true source of the city's misfortunes, both locally and nationally. The arrival of the Montagnard representatives on mission from the convention in March endorsing all that the local Jacobins had done, finally provoked the sections into outright resistance. Forming a central committee on the Parisian pattern of the previous summer, they resisted further militancy so successfully with the cry that it is time for the anarchy of a few men of blood to stop that on 27 April the deputies on mission fled the city and left their allies in the club to their fate. From the safety of Mont Montelimar, they proclaimed that Marseille was in a state of counter-revolution. In fact, it was in a state of faction-torn chaos, and it took three more weeks before members of the club were arrested by the Central Committee. But from Paris, Marseille seemed to be in revolt, espousing federalism against the one and indivisible republic. Certainly, news of the downfall of the Marseille Jacobins promoted unrest against their satellites elsewhere in the Midi. Resistance to the militants who had dominated local affairs since the previous summer began to revive in Aix, Arles, and Avignon. In Nimes, a long-standing rivalry between two clubs led the less extreme one to appeal for support to the city's sections against a rival increasingly committed to the radicalism of Paris, of the Paris Mother Society. And on 20th May, the 12 sections of Nimes declared themselves to be in permanent session. All over the South, in fact, the extremism with which Jacobin Club members responded to the renewed national crisis of the spring provoked a backlash of protest even among many who had accepted the declaration of the Republic and the execution of the King. And nowhere was this process more spectacular and more menacing for the future of the young Republic than in the nation's second city, Lyon. The silk industry, which was the basis of Lyon's economy.
had been in crisis when the revolution broke out. But events after 1789 only worsened his problems. Silk was a luxury product, but those who had normally bought silk goods before the revolution quickly learned that ostentation could be dangerous in the new times and demand slump. War brought a shrinkage in foreign markets, too. And disruptions in the supply of raw materials from Savoy. Nor did the austere Republicans who took control in Paris in 1792 have much sympathy for distress in the luxury trades. Montagnard's attacks on Roland, who had lived in Lyon and been a vocal defender of its interests between 1784 and 91, also did little to endear the militants of Paris to most Lyonnais. And yet, as in Marseille, the reluctance of the city's notables to involve themselves in the turbulent new world of electoral politics meant that in November 1792, Jacobin activists, led by the unbalanced former manufacturer Joseph Chalier, were able to take over local government, especially after previous elected officials has been discredited by a week of food riots and popular price fixing during September. But in fact, Chalier and his friends had nothing to offer beyond parroting the resolutions and policies of the Paris, the Paris Jacobin Club and their attempts to ensure plentiful supplies of cheap bread were vitiated by lack of money. Disruption of supply networks far from the city and competing claims for provisioning the armies manning the southeastern frontiers. The maximum decreed in Paris on 3rd May simply could not be implemented under Lyonnais' conditions. Bread in Lyon cost almost a third more than in Paris, and the whole month was marked by acute anxieties over essential supplies. They culminated on the 24th in the ransacking of a warehouse full of provisions destined for the ummies. Crowds of women sold them off at what they deemed fair prices. The response of the convention's representatives on mission was to order troops from the Alpine front to march on Lyon, but news of this brought on a confrontation between the city's sections and the municipality. The sections knew that the troops would place in the hands of the local Jacobins a coercive power they had hitherto lacked. They feared a massacre if that happened. And in the circumstances, they demanded that the National Guard, which the sections controlled, be mobilized. On the 28th, the departmental authorities overrode municipal objections and called them to arms. 
And the next day, this force stormed the town hall and overthrew the Jacobin commune. Lyon, too, was now in open revolt against the convention. <coughs> and meanwhile, the rural uprising in the West was growing ever more serious. The convention's decree of 19 March that all rebels captured with arms in their hands should be put to death did nothing to deter the rebels who captured town after town in the uplands of the Vendée and with every success expanded their numbers. As many as 45,000 men seem to have joined the Catholic and Royal Ummies, as they were now openly calling themselves, in the course of the spring. Against them, the Republic was scarcely able at this stage to field more than 15 or 16,000, and even the minority of seasoned troops among them had no experience of the type of war they were now compelled to fight. The Vendéan armies materialized suddenly and supplied themselves from their own country. They melted away just as rapidly when checked. Whereas the only safety for the Blues, as the Republican troops soon became known, lay in keeping together in large units. They were quite unable to garrison potential strong points adequately before the rebels stormed them and down into June rebel-controlled territory continued to expand. On 5th May, they took Thouars. On 25th, Fontenay, threatening to break out to the sea where they could get access to British support. On 7 June, they took Douai, pushing north towards Loire. And on the 9th, they reached it when they occupied Saumur, driving out Santerre, commander of the Paris National Guard, who had reached the Vendée with a bataillon of patriotic volunteers only three weeks beforehand. By May 1793, therefore, the new crisis for the Republic that had erupted in March had grown spectacularly worse. As the Ummies fell back along every frontier, a new internal war zone established itself in what would soon be called the Military Vendée. And the convention even began to lose control of major provincial cities. The response of politicians in Paris was destined to make these problems even worse before they got better.